Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about the life of Oscar Wilde, 19th century writer from Dublin. We're going to talk about how he shot to fame even before his writings would. We're also going to talk about his famous trial and his eventual jailing and forced exile. We'll ask if it was how forced it actually was in a moment. Uh, but anyways, all of that is jailing the trial, the exile due to his homosexuality. My guest for this conversation is Dr. Matthew Sturgis. Matthew Sturgis is a historian and a biographer. He's written two previous biographies, and he has a new one out about Oscar Wilde, which is called Oscar Wilde, A Life. He joins me on Zoom. Matthew Sturgis, great pleasure, sir, to welcome you to this radio program. Uh, thank you very much, Mitch. It's a great pleasure to, to be here virtually. I, I think Many people, I think almost everyone, knows of Oscar Wilde. His one-liners are still often quoted today. It's hard probably to go to a week without even seeing one. But what I, what wasn't so clear to me, and I didn't know until I started spending time with your book, and I'm not a literature scholar, uh, was that Oscar Wilde seemed to achieve fame long before even his own writings would. And he seemed to become famous just for being himself. Uh, yes, I mean, it is a, it's a remarkable phenomenon, or certainly was a remarkable phenomenon then, I mean, uh, uh, then being the, the end of the 19th century. Uh, of course, now it, it's an absolute commonplace that people become famous for being famous, and uh, we live in a, a sort of cloud of so-called celebrity culture. Uh, but uh, but Wilde is really a, a, a very early uh, an interesting example of that. He, he uh, left university. He'd had a stellar career at um, at Oxford. He'd, he'd done a sort of preliminary, uh, sort of half of his degree in his native Dublin at Trinity College Dublin, but then had transferred to Oxford University and um, uh, really been one of the star pupils of his uh, his generation. Um, he'd also devoted a certain amount of time to literature. He was mad about poetry. He wrote poems. He got them published in little magazines. And uh, and he sort of, I think, saw his um, uh, his his future in literature. Uh, but there was a memorable moment, sort of attested by his contemporaries, that uh, uh, towards the end of his university career, he was sitting with two friends and they were discussing what they would do after university and... Uh, um, his uh, companions sort of you know, said how they were hoping to get into, you know, their father's solicitor's firm or, you know, do whatever you know, conventional thing might be expected of them. Uh, but Oscar said, well, he thought he wanted to write, but um, more than that, he wanted to be famous. And I mean, it was an extraordinary thing to say um, at that uh, time. And I suppose it was an intuition he had on his part that, you know, fame was something that was becoming, uh, you know, a fact in uh, in the modern world and uh, of of his time, and it was really, I suppose, uh, a feature and a function of the huge proliferation in the press at that time, uh, uh, because of you know, various uh, universal education acts in the in the generation before the the, uh, the reading public in Britain had grown enormously. And it was being sort of catered for uh, by uh, a proliferation of new newspapers, magazines, um, periodicals. And they, of course, all needed content, uh, stuff to, uh, to write about. And sort of during the course of, uh, of the 1870s into the 1880s, there was a sort of shift, I think, really, in the sort of content that they wanted. And Wilde realized that it wasn't just uh, facts and information that um, uh, was important to these uh, these periodicals, but personalities. People wanted to hear about people. And he sort of intuited this sort of possibility that you know he could be one of those uh, one of those people. Um, obviously he had to ally himself to something. Um, and he chose to ally uh, to ally himself to this existing artistic movement, the uh, movement called aestheticism, which was really something that grew off the back of um, uh, the pre-Raphaelite uh, um, 
painters and uh, artists of the uh, of the previous decade. Uh, the idea that art uh, was enormously important and should be introduced into every aspect of uh, of life. And I think he sort of, uh, I mean, Wilde was a, a passionate advocate of, uh, of the movement and fascinated by it and uh, decorated his rooms at, uh, at college in a splendid uh, um, aesthetic style. Um, uh, but he also understood that the great figures of the movement, people like uh, William Morris or Rossetti or um, uh, Byrne Jones, they were all now middle-aged or elderly figures. They were retiring um, by nature, I mean, uh, Morris less so, but Morris was being drawn off into the world of politics. Um, and that there was a sort of opportunity there to, uh, for him to become um, a mouthpiece for the movement, a per the sort of personal embodiment of it. And really, I suppose that's what he set about doing, and that was what began to give him his, uh, his profile. Um, he was ridiculed in many quarters, for, um, for his sort of extravagances and his pose. But again, he had uh, this essentially modern intuition that uh, ridicule wasn't something to be avoided um, because it couldn't be. It should be embraced and really all publicity was good publicity. And so um, rather than uh, sort of denying the claims of the ridiculers, he um, uh, accepted them uh, as a badge of honour and uh, embraced them. And uh, and all that yes uh, contributed and built up um, his uh, his his fame uh, at this remarkably young age and at a time when he'd published no more than a, a sort of handful of poems in uh, in magazines. Is there anything that's happening with information technology at the time? If we look at history, oftentimes when you see the rise of somebody from obscurity, oftentimes it's connected uh, to some kind of invention concerning technology and communications, whether you go to Martin Luther and the rise of the uh, printing press today with, as you were mentioning, there's almost everyone's a celebrity today because of the internet. Was there any, was there any communication technology that enabled Oscar Wilde to have this early fame that was still somewhat uncommon? Um, well, I think uh, the, the, the fact that um, printing was becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper was hugely important. I mean, that there were um, so many newspapers, so many magazines, but it, it required the fact of there being uh, a larger <coughs> readership ready to consume them uh, as well. Um, and the world was shrinking, I mean, because of, uh, uh, through uh, telegraphy uh, as well, the, um, uh, Wilde's reputation uh, became uh, international, uh, um, uh, very sort of almost as it uh, was occurring in England. Um, uh, the, uh, not only was he, um, by his doings and his sayings beginning to be reported in the British press, but they were then relayed to the um, the American press, the Australian press. So they even began to be mentioned in some uh, European papers. And, of course, that was significant and um, uh, useful to Wilde when he was confronted with the, the problem that is faced really by all uh, you know, celebrities is that how do they actually monetize their fame? I mean, they've achieved this uh, remarkable uh, renown, but uh, as you say, on the back of very little actual achievement. Uh, and so they then have to try and discover a way to um, uh, to make uh, money. And uh, the world of uh, sort of celebrity endorsements hadn't quite taken hold uh, in uh, the beginning of the 1880s when uh, Oscar um, won his initial success, uh, and so he had to find something uh, something else. And and I think initially he had thought that his fame was going to be a great asset to him in his literary career and his literary ambitions. And I think it, it was a shock and a disappointment to realise that that was absolutely not the case. I mean uh, that. Um, uh, you know, he produced uh, a little volume of his poems. He'd collected the, the various things that he'd written together, and he assumed that a, a publisher would be, you know, uh, gagging to uh, 
to produce it. But in fact, he was turned down by the several publishers he approached and eventually had to essentially finance uh, the production of his book uh, himself. Um, he'd also written a play, uh, of which he was rather proud, of, um, uh, a four-act melodrama, a melodrama set in, uh, in Tsarist Russia about a nihilist conspiracy. Um, but uh, he touted it around all the uh, producers and they all politely turned it down. So he, he, he was then confronted by the fact that, you know, his fame wasn't delivering quite what he hoped it, uh, it would. And uh, after considerable discussion amongst his friends as to uh, what he might do, there was a, uh, one idea that he might perhaps would go on the stage uh, or was another thought that he might st uh, start a market garden because he'd been so successful, uh, you know, he'd made such a reputation out of um, enthusing about lilies and sunflowers uh, that uh, there might be some benefit in that. Um, it was decided that really a lecture tour would um, be the um, uh, the best way forward and, and, the, uh, and a lecture tour of America because the, uh, his reputation had begun to grow in America. Uh, Amer America, I mean, had a, a vast uh, population, uh, but but also, as uh, in Britain, a, a very well-established sort of circuit for public lectures. Um, and, uh, and that was what uh, brought him in 1882 uh, to, uh, to North America. Uh, and he ended up really spending a whole year um, uh, um, uh, lecturing across the country. What was he lecturing about? Well, initially, uh, he'd worked out a rather sort of um, a theoretical lecture about what he termed the English Renaissance, but it was really about aestheticism, about the, the ideas um, uh, behind it, uh, how it arose out of pre-Raphaelitism, um, you know the, the concept of the, the moral force of beauty and uh, and other such matters. But having given it about twice, he was taken aside by um, uh, a, a publisher in Philadelphia who explained that uh, the Americans really liked um, uh, more practical information and um, uh, sort of uh, uh, a sort of a vision of how ideas could be put to use. And so he very rapidly revamped his lecture and it, and it became a, a sort of talk on um, uh, the, the virtues and, uh, and benefits of, uh, of uh, home decoration. I mean, how to carry aesthetic ideas in uh, into life. One of the influences on Oscar Wilde, and you mentioned him earlier, was an aesthetic, William Morris, um, William Morris was known as, as an aesthetic, but he was also known as and is revered today by sort of leftist historians uh, as, as an early as an early socialist. Tell me about the influence of William Morris on Oscar Wilde. And did Oscar Wilde have politics? He, he did write um, he did write an essay called The Soul of Man Under Socialism. Yes, uh, indeed. And um, no, he certainly did have uh, political views and. Um, they were influenced by uh, Morris's ideas to a degree. I mean, he uh, <coughs> Wilde revered Morris enormously um, as a, an artist and a designer. He decorated his rooms with Morris wallpapers. Uh, he loved Morris's poetry um, uh, and uh, uh, wrote about it and um, indeed borrowed from it. Um, and... <coughs> He, uh, he was excited also by his socialistic ideas. I mean, that it fed in part from uh, Wilde's um, sort of uh, existence as an Irishman um, that uh, the, there was such pressing need for um, political solutions in Ireland, but, but both the prospect of um, home rule for, for Ireland at a time when uh, they didn't have their own, uh, their own government separate from... Uh, the British government in Westminster, and um, and also for land reform uh, there, that uh, that well, sort of Wilde's uh, uh, sort of Irish political engagement was one of the things that drew him towards socialism anyway. Uh, but then I think also the fact that Morris espoused it and um, was another thing that um, 
uh, encouraged him to uh, to explore it as an idea. I mean, the rather personal vision of socialism that Wilde eventually um, uh, developed and, and wrote in his wonderful essay, The Soul of Man Under Socialism, is, is really a, a, an extreme sort of individualism or anarchism where uh, the sort of mechanism of the state takes over all the, uh, the boring aspects of life to, to allow people, or especially Oscar Wilde, to be as much like Oscar Wilde as he wants to be. <laughs> I think many people have a dream <laughs> like that. I know, but it's, it's a very good essay, as I say. Uh, Oscar Wilde, of course, is, is known for his way with words and and wit, um, but that didn't come out of nowhere. His both of his parents, you you write, uh, were also very good with words and wit. They were. I mean, that was one of the fascinating things about writing and researching the book was to uh, to realize how uh, prominent and impressive his parents were. His father, Sir William Wilde, was one of those <coughs> sort of terrifying Victorian polymaths. I mean, uh, when you go and visit Wilde's house in Dublin in Merrion Square. There's a plaque up on the um, on the front of the house and you approach it thinking, oh yes, this is the house. It'll be saying something about Oscar. But in fact, it's a, a plaque to Sir William Wilde and he's described, I mean, I can't remember the full list, but it, you know, he was a surgeon, oculist, orist, statistician, uh, ethnologist, historian, topographist. I mean, it's all listed there on the on the plaque, and he, he wrote a, a series of um, popular and interesting books about his his travels, and then uh, and then Oscar's mother was this sort of phenomenal figure, um, uh, Jane Wilde, who wrote patriotic uh, uh, sort of nationalist Irish nationalist verse as a young woman under the nom de plume Speranza, the Italian for hope, and she was a a great figure in the in the sort of nationalist cause of um, uh, of Ireland and uh, revered and read by by many, mm-hmm. but also one of those sort of larger than life uh, figures who um, cr- created excitement around her wherever she went. And uh, um, I mean, she had great hopes and visions for her, her sons, I mean, Oscar and her uh, Oscar's elder brother uh, Willie. I mean, while she was, you know, um, nursing Willie as a child, rocking him in his cradle, she sort of fondly imagined that he might be the first president of an Irish republic, you know, because he had such an intelligent look in his you know, baby, baby-faced eyes. Uh, but um, uh, she uh, certainly sort of uh, encouraged Wilde in his uh, his literary ambitions and. Uh, um, and supported him every step of the way. Was Oscar Wilde a nationalist? Yes, yes. I mean, he um, uh, he certainly uh, believed in home rule uh, for Ireland. Um, he, yes, I mean, his his political views do sort of sweep around a bit, but um, uh, he was, a, uh, as a young man, he was a Republican, certainly. I mean, he uh, expressed Republican uh, views and wrote Republican poems. Um, of course, he was delighted to meet Queen Victoria when he did and thought she was one of the three great women of the 19th century, along with Sarah Bernhardt and Ellen Terry, and said he would have happily married any, any one of them. Um, but, uh, but no, I mean, his, uh, his, his heart and, um, uh, and his stated beliefs were, were certainly for, uh, for Ireland and Irish home rule. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation with Matthew Sturgis, who is the author of a biography called Oscar Wilde, A Life. It is what we are in conversation about. Oscar Wilde is also known for two trials, uh, and we'll get to those trials in a moment, but they are both related to his homosexuality. Uh, You write it's in the mid-1880s that Oscar Wilde has his first homosexual experience with another man. Um, what what do we know about that? And what do we know about his homosexuality? What kind of record is there about it? Uh, well, well, obviously, I mean, there's, there's the trial itself. But, uh, yes. But before I, mean, um, I mean, it's uh, so wild as a, um, as a young man when he was achieving this uh, famous, the, the apostle of aestheticism, was 
he was a, a flamboyant and uh, and slightly effeminate figure. He had long hair. He wore sort of velvet jackets. He um, uh, sort of uh, had extravagant mannerisms, all slightly um, not belied, but sort of standing uh, <clears throat> against the fact that he was um, a, a sort of strapping great um, um, chap. I mean, he you know six foot tall, broad, uh, uh, broad in the back, immensely strong. Um, uh, sort of with a wonderful infectious energy about him. Um, and so many early commentators remark on his um, uh, his effeminacy. But uh, at that period, effeminacy, uh, they would also remark that it made it enormously attractive uh, to young women. And he was always surrounded by young women. He had many sort of flirtations and... Um, uh, not quite affairs uh, uh, with people, but um, he, uh, he was surrounded always by young female admirers, much to the annoyance of, uh, uh, of young men in many social situations. Um, and when he came back from his lecture tour in America, quite soon after that, he married this beautiful uh, young Irish girl who he uh, had known or his family had known for some time. It was, you know, agreed by everybody that it was, uh, a love match, although it helped, of course, that she had um, a large private income. Um, and they set up a very um, uh, happy and um, aesthetically appointed home in Chelsea. And they had two small children, in quite, uh, but two sons in uh, quite quick succession. And I think it was really sort of at that moment when his life was sort of beginning to take on this rather conventional aspect. Suddenly he was a he was a father, he was a husband, he was a homeowner. Um, and about this moment, he was offered a job editing uh, a woman's magazine, uh, The Woman's World, um, which he was delighted to take on. You know, it was his first uh, ever uh, paid employment, uh, you know, also regular income that he, uh, that he had. Um, but sort of against that sort of tide of conventionality, he's, uh, I think the, there was a sort of force of reaction and he, um, really on his own testimony and on um, a pri privately given to uh, uh, friends, I'm just in conversation with uh, friends, it seems that it was this young friend of the family called Robbie Ross, who, uh, although, um, you know, only in his late teens at the time, when, uh, whereas Wilde was, um, uh, uh, was 30 or 31, um, was sort of entirely confident about his own sexuality, his own homosexuality, and he seduced um, Wilde. And, and that seduction came as a sort of revelation uh, to Oscar and um, obviously a, um, a revelation of his, uh, of his sexual nature and his sexual being. Uh, but, but I think it... Um, excited and affected him in other ways as, uh, as well. I mean, it, it put him outside society uh, in a way that he found exciting homosexuality uh, was illegal and really had just been made more illegal in that uh, a piece of uh, Victorian legislation had gone through Parliament that criminalised all sexual acts uh, uh, between men, um, which was, uh, uh, was something new. And he finds this exciting. He found that exciting. He, he uh, you know, if he if he was worried that he was becoming uh, sort of uh, hidebound by conventionality, suddenly here he here was he outside the law, and he, and he was fascinated uh, and had always been fascinated and intrigued by figures who were outside the uh, the law, sort of um, uh, artists like Thomas Wainwright, who was also a poisoner, the uh, the poet Chatterton, who. Um, uh, you know, made his uh, career uh, forging poems. I'm not uh, uh, exactly illegal, but uh, but certainly uh, no, um, duplicitous. And and also, of course, he was um, fascinated and had long been fascinated by the uh, uh, traditions of Greek, uh, ancient Greek homosexuality. He, he was a classicist. He's, he studied Greek and Latin at, uh, at university. And at a period when this acknowledgement of homosexuality or uh, pederasty, as it was um, 
uh, called in Greek culture, ancient Greek culture, was just beginning to be acknowledged by the scholarly community. For, for generations, centuries really, it had been covered up uh, as a sort of awkward fact of, uh, of classical life. Uh, but um, rigorous German scholars and their, their, their English um, uh, confrères were beginning to, uh, to re-examine the texts texts and sort of acknowledge the truth of what they uh, they found there and of course the perhaps the uh, the great um, locus for the discussion of uh, of pederasty is in Plato's symposium and in that I don't know if you recall but uh, there's a moment when um, Socrates is sort of explaining about how creativity exists. And uh, he says, you know, if a, if a Greek man wants to create a beautiful person, well, he, he finds a beautiful woman and uh, they have a child together and you know, they they have a, a beautiful person. But if uh, a Greek man wants to create a beautiful work of art, well, then he should find a, a beautiful youth, a young man, and his love for him and um, his comeliness and his loveliness um, will inspire a great work of art or a great philosophical uh, idea or whatever. And th this, I mean, when Wilde uh, read about it as a student, seems a sort of fascinating and um, curious idea. Uh, but it sort of st stayed with him throughout his, uh, his life as he, as he grew up. And suddenly he found himself almost in alignment uh, with it. And certainly I think he, he always... I mean, having embraced <coughs> his homosexuality, he um, he did uh, feel uh, that in some way it related to that ideal. I mean, he didn't uh, idealize it completely, but uh, um, but I think also you could say that it it had that effect uh, on him. I mean, the great works that he produced really uh, concentrated into an extraordinary short period of time. Um, uh, after um, he began having having sexual relations with men. What's going on in England at this time to bring such laws to further criminalize homosexuality? Well, the the, the Labouchere Amendment was, um, as it was called, uh, um, was something that was sort of whisked through Parliament on the back of uh, actually other legislation about they were uh, trying to uh, they were raising the age of consent, uh, of female uh, sexual consent, uh, which had been 13 and putting it up to, uh, to 16. And uh, there was also a sort of, um, th there'd been a few uh, scandals um, in the um, uh, sort of suppressed, uh, uh, sort of in the, in the papers, but uh, uh, of you know, groups of um, homosexual men sort of gathering in, in brothels in central London and corrupting young telegraph boys. And I think there was a sort of, uh, yes, yeah, so a sort of feeling that, um, of, you know, sort of moral panic that uh, was sort of stirred up briefly and then subsided. Um, but, you know, it was always likely to, uh, to, to spring up again. Interesting that it's during this period of time that we do get many of the great writings uh, from Oscar Wilde, including a, a picture, the picture of Dorian Gray. Um, and, and But his writings are never, he has a very antagonistic relationship to the critics and the press, doesn't he? Yes. I mean, that, that was, I think, um, something that was generated from the beginning of his career when the the press resented enormously the fact of his great you know of him having achieved this great fame on the basis of having done absolutely nothing and so when um you know he produced his little volume of, uh, of poems which he uh, paid for um the majority of them were absolutely foul uh, about it he got very poor reviews when his his play Vera uh, about the Russian nihilists was put on in America uh, because after his successful lecture tour, um, an American producer thought, well, you know, he's so famous uh, now in America uh, from that, um, uh, you know, this play will, will have a, um, a, 
an audience. Uh, again, um, the, the critics sort of leapt upon it and it was savaged uh, when it opened in New York and then the, the British press sort of delighted in its failure. And I think it's interesting and uh, that, uh, you know, uh, that five years later, you know, it was five years before he really published anything of note again. And then what he produced was his wonderful book of fairy stories, uh, The Happy Prince and other uh, other fairy tales, fairy stories. And um, and I, I sort of suspect that he, he wanted to sort of represent himself uh, as a, you know, an author of fairy stories because he felt that the critic, you know, that, that you can't, as a critic, sort of savage a book of fairy stories. Uh, I mean, it would just seem sort of uh, a ridiculous response to it. Uh, and indeed, it was um, critically um, uh, uh, I mean, received generously by the critics, uh, by and large. Uh, and, and you know, it is full of wild and wit and, uh, and charm. And um, he was he was he was able to sort of uh, get that across in a in a way that was accepted. I mean, uh, the picture of Dorian Gray when it came out, his first and his only uh, novel that was, uh, I mean, it created a huge sort of debate um, when it came out. And so, although we remember many of the uh, the harsher attacks on it, uh, the, the, there were also um, uh, favourable uh, reviews. I and mean, people realised it was an amazing story. Uh, and, uh, you know, the fact that it endures, that, um, uh, that it's still read, that it's turned into plays, I mean, uh, only... I think this morning, I think, uh, sort of um, on my phone, some uh, New Yorker cartoon cropped up, uh, making a reference to, uh, to Dorian Gray and the idea, you know, of the, the picture in the attic or whatever. It's become uh, and remains part of the currency of, uh, of our cultural world. Talk to me about the two trials of Oscar Wilde. The first one, Oscar Wilde actually brings against man by the name of Queensberry, the second trial is then against him and a reaction from yeah. the first trial he brought out. And this all does relate to a relationship that he had with Lord Alfred Douglas. Tell me about that. So, so while um, um, as he became sort of more artistically successful, he uh, after the picture of John Gray, he wrote uh, the first of his really successful uh, plays, uh, Lady Windermere's Fan. Uh, and he suddenly realised that this was his metier, writing uh, these brilliantly witty social comedies with a uh, you know, full of wit, but full of ideas as well, uh, full of um, uh, a sort of playful uh, sense of, uh, of the possibilities of, uh, of the comic stage. Uh, and if you wrote a successful play, you began to uh, earn huge amounts of, uh, of money. It was... Um, uh, you know, the first time in Wilde's life that he had money. Of course, as soon as he started earning money, um, he started spending even more. So he never quite got himself out of the, the, the financial troubles that he sort of lived with throughout his life. Um, but it sort of attracted more and more attention and more, uh, um, and more, and more people uh, to him. And amongst those who were uh, drawn to him was this beautiful young, uh, at that time, Oxford under graduate called Lord Alfred Douglas. And they began a, an amazing affair, love affair, uh, uh, really. They were, um, I mean, Wilde, I think, in some of his moods sort of related it to that um, ideal of Plato's symposium of, you know, him as the uh, the elder intellectual man, uh, Douglas as the, the beautiful young beloved. Um, but I mean, it was a, a troubled relationship in its way because uh, Douglas had a violent temper and a sort of slightly, uh, you know, troubled core, I think. Uh, but uh, it was also made difficult by the fact that Douglas's father was this very irascible um, old aristocrat called the Marquis of Queensbury, uh, famous in Britain for codifying the rules of boxing, the Queensbury rules, which gives you an idea of his sort of interests and, uh, and general tenor. Uh, but... He, amongst other things, uh, was a what we now call a homophobe. He, he sort of had an absolute horror of the idea of 
relationships, uh, same-sex relationships. And although he didn't know that uh, um, uh, Wild and uh, his son, um, what exactly that relationship was, he just felt it looked, uh, you know, it looked fishy uh, to him. And he was determined to break it up. And so he launched this um, concerted attack um, uh, on the relationship and was always threatening to create a, a scene, a, a public scene. That was what he wanted to do. He said that if he found them dining together in a restaurant, you know, he'd denounce Wild and he'd bring his horse whip or he'd, he intended to disrupt the uh, first night of the... Um, importance of being earnest when that, when that opened and was luckily sort of turned away from the theatre by uh, uh, by the police. Uh, he, he was planning to either throw a, a, a sort of bouquet of vegetables or present it to, to Wilde at the, uh, um, at the curtain. Um, but Wilde, I think, just felt that this... Uh, uh, this awful strain of um, uh, of Queensbury's campaign against him uh, was, you know, unsettling and uh, completely undermining the pleasure he should be taking in his success. And he was looking for some way to make it stop. And when uh, Queensbury, disappointed in being able to deliver these vegetables, uh, a few days later went to Wilde's club and left a card for him, um, uh, on which he'd, uh, I mean, it was his own card, but he'd written for Oscar Wilde, and then as he thought, posing sodomite. Um, although in his sort of intemperance, he'd misspelled sodomite and spelled it somdomite. But anyway, a few days later, Oscar turned up and was given the card. And instead of, you know, making some comment about the poor spelling of the aristocracy, he, uh, he thought, no, this is an opportunity where I can... Um, uh, to stop Queensbridge attacks because this constitutes uh, a, a libel, a criminal libel. Um, and so I can take him to court and get him to desist. Um, and so he took it to his uh, to a solicitor who said, yes, that is indeed the case. And um, uh, Douglas uh, was um, enormously enthusiastic about the idea. He hated his father and, as he said, wanted to see him in the dock. And they thought at that stage that the case um, was focusing entirely just on their relationship. And obviously they could choose to deny whatever uh, physical aspects um, uh, of it that they uh, they chose. And, um, and also uh, the only other thing Queensbury had was, you know, his, uh, his complaints about Oscar's books, which he thought were, immoral but uh, you know the, the the picture of Dorian Gray sort of uh, seemed to suggest immoral practices but you know Wilde was uh, a brilliant um, uh, uh, literary uh, sort of uh, critic and uh, discourser and would have been very happy to uh, to defend himself on that ground uh, you know on the grounds that there are no moral or immoral books books are either well written or badly written as he said um, and and so they got, uh, so Wilde got drawn into the idea of um, uh, of this case, uh, thinking that he was going to win. Uh, and indeed, um, as the thing stood at the moment, uh, when um, uh, when Wilde took out the action, uh, I mean, literary uh, uh, legal uh, um, uh, experts say that he probably would have. Uh, uh, been able to uh, secure a verdict against Queensbury. But what he hadn't counted for was the fact that Queensbury's solicitors uh, employed some uh, sort of private detectives who began to sort of tease away at, uh, at Wilde's um, life and discovered that he and Douglas had been sort of engaged uh, for some years previously on a sort of exploration of the uh, the Victorian sexual underworld uh, and uh, had been uh, taking up these young uh, rent boys in uh, Piccadilly and, and central London and uh, and having sex with them and um, they were able to put pressure on some of these uh, uh, these chaps to uh, to uh, um, give statements uh, against against wild and 
So, you know, on the moment before the trial, when the um, Queensbury had to uh, sort of give, give his plea of justification, as it was called, suddenly Wilde was confronted by this awful fact that they, they had amassed all this um, information with dates and times uh, against him and, and that yeah, were potential witnesses who would come forward um, to show that he'd certainly done rather more than just posing as a sodomite. Um, and it was a sort of knockdown blow, as um, uh, his friend Reggie Turner described it. But nevertheless, he, he, there was no way he could withdraw from the action at that stage. He was committed uh, to it, so he, he had to go to the um, uh, go to the Old Bailey, launch this action against Queensbury, and then Queensbury had a brilliant um, uh, uh, barrister uh, appearing for him. Uh, um, a man called uh, Carson, who had been at um, at Trinity College Dublin uh, with Wilde as a sort of added sort of twist in the tale. And he uh, sort of broke Wilde down sort of under uh, uh, cross-examination and uh, um, uh, sort of laid out the, um, uh, the charges against him with such forcefulness that uh, Wilde uh, or Wilde's attorneys suggested that they must withdraw from the action and and allow Queens, you know, allow um, uh, Queensbury's uh, libel to stand. And then he would end up being prosecuted. Well, yes. And so, so then he had brought down this catastrophe upon himself and, and Queensbury's solicitors then uh, delivered all the witness statements that they'd received, all the information that they'd got from these rent boys to the Crown Prosecution Service uh, and a warrant was issued um, for Wilde's arrest. Um, there was a thought that he might try and leave the country there was, uh, and um, go abroad, uh, and maybe even that the authorities hoped that he would do that. Um, uh, but he didn't. He, he seemed sort of, in a way, so stunned by the verdict, he didn't know what to do, and in the end did nothing, uh, and uh, sat in the Cadogan Hotel drinking um, hock and seltzer, uh, until there was a knock on the door and um, uh, the, the police arrived to arrest him. And then suddenly he was caught up in this, uh, the machinery of the Victorian uh, legal system. And in fact, uh, you say there was one trial. What happened? There were, there were two further trials because the first trial uh, went forward. All the, the witnesses came forward. They gave the, this, the, these damning accounts of Bud's um uh, relations with them, but even so, the jury was unable to reach a unanimous verdict. Um, I think partly because I, many people in the general public, um, maybe they didn't want to believe anything uh, bad about Wilde, but there was also enormous um, dislike of this so-called Labouchere amend uh, amendment, um, and people were, were were reluctant to convict on it. Uh, but um, when that trial broke, uh, broke down, uh, a retrial was ordered and uh, the Attorney General himself sort of took uh, control of um, the prosecution and uh, they eventually man managed to secure it. And then Wilde was um, uh, condemned uh, to two years hard labour, which was the maximum that the, uh, the court was allowed to, um, to impose. Uh, which was uh, an horrific uh, thing for you know for a intelligent a man used to you know living in comfort in society suddenly to be plunged into this world of um, well isolation I think was one of the things that was most cruel to uh, to Oscar but uh, but also uh, hideous uh, discomfort and um, uh, and meanness. For the sake of time, I'm going to move us towards the end of Oscar Wilde's life. He would spend two years hard labor in prison, and then he'd go into exile after that, and then he would die shortly after that in 1900 at the age of just 46 years old. There's a quote that you have from him during this end of his life that really stood out to me, and it's this, quote, I am fighting a battle to the death with my wallpaper. One of us will have to go. I couldn't help. We were talking earlier about William Morris 
And for all the things William Morris is remembered for is also as his designs on wallpaper. I couldn't help but think of William Morris when I actually read that line. Maybe there's no connection. I don't know. But that's- <laughs> Well, I mean, there is a connection in that, uh, in that Oscar Wilde realized the huge importance of having good wallpaper, which uh, was something that he'd learned from William Morris. If, if um, uh, the, um, at the end of his life um, uh, in exile in, in Paris, um, Wilde was staying in uh, a, a modest but not, not um, terrible hotel um, uh, uh, called the Hotel d'Alsace in the Rue des Beaux-Arts. Um, I mean, it's still, it still exists in Paris, although it's now called L'Hotel and is, and is the height of, um, uh, of a sort of um, boutique luxury. But, um, but when Wilde was saying that, it was a, a much more modest um, uh, institution. And the, uh, the, there is remarkably a picture of him, alas, dead in his bed with this uh, rather terrible... Um, uh, pattern wallpaper behind him, not William Morris uh, at all. Um, but it was always his contention that the the aesthetic aspects of life are, are, are not sort of additions, you know, uh, uh, to existence. They stand absolutely at the core um, of it, of of existence, and um, that. That's why they are so important, that you must be surrounded by beauty because it will have a beneficial effect on you. Um, I mean, in his Ruskinian phase and, and something that he shared with Morris, there was a, a, a belief that it had a, a, a moral force that, you know, um, that if you were surrounded by beautiful things, they would make you happy and they would make you good. And... Um, so to find yourself in a room with bad wallpaper was um, was a very distressing thing for uh, for an, uh, for an East Beat. Um, but it also, I think, yes, I mean, this is a telling thing that there, right at the end of his life, um, ill at that stage, confined to his bed with this um, uh, ear infection that was going to uh, carry him off, uh, he still uh, could both perceive the importance of beauty, but frame it uh, with his customary wit. He, he died of meningitis? Yes, he, he'd had this sort of chronic ear infection for several years, and, and uh, yes, it got um, um, through his inner ear into the, um, the surroundings of the brain and caused meningitis. And the press at the time in England said that he soon would be forgotten. Yes, I mean, this is an extraordinary verdict at the time. They were all saying, they were sort of relieved, I think, more than delighted that he died. He was a sort of, uh, there was a feeling that he was an embarrassment um, who, uh, you know, was really best forgotten as quickly as possible. They thought his plays wouldn't last. They um, thought his books would be forgotten. They thought... Uh, his most, even his wonderful witticisms, uh, they didn't um, uh, set much store by. They, they thought that perhaps his most memorable line was his uh, disappointment in the Atlantic Ocean, which he uh, declared when he'd arrived in America um, for the first time. Um, but it was interesting how very, very quickly they were proved wrong and, and how his... Um, his rehabilitation really began almost in the um, in the decade after his uh, his death, and has continued remarkably ever since. And I think almost all on a continuously upward trajectory. I mean, he's more famous now than uh, than ever before. Matthew Sturgis, thank you. Uh, Mitch, thank you very much. Matthew Sturgis has been our guest. He has joined us for a conversation on his new book. It's called Oscar Wilde, A Life.